Welcome, New Mount Zion family and visitors, to another virtual Sunday School class from the Cross Comprehensive Review of Sacred Scripture. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for loving us. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness and for supplying all of our need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. As we prepare to study your word, we ask that you will prepare our hearts to receive your word with understanding. As we are led by the Holy Spirit, may we respond in obedience to your will. We ask, Lord God, that you will forgive our sins, that you will bless this class in every class that exalts the name of Jesus. We pray your blessing on the under shepherd of this church, his family, our church family, and the body of Christ. Lord God, we ask that you will bless us, that we may be a blessing to someone in need. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the love that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The date is October the 22nd in the year 2023. To our visitors, our senior pastor, Reverend Larry L. Roundtree II, welcomes you to the New Mount Zion Church family, where we are with God's grace, changing the world through the love of Christ, one soul at a time. Our quarterly theme is Our God Gives. I am Deacon Keith Poe, and I will be serving as the facilitator for today's lesson. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We should pass his message of love and salvation on from generation to generation. Today's lesson scripture, Galatians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 14. Our lesson focus. Do not be fooled. Only faith in Christ saves you. Our theme talk for today. I've heard that one before. Some of the stories we hear lose their impact as we hear them again and again. That story that seems so hilarious the first time we heard it barely inspires a smile after the tenth time. One story, however, never loses its impact. The story of salvation. Why? Because it is our story. It began when Adam and Eve sinned continued through Christ's sacrificial death and still continues through our acceptance of God's forgiveness. This is the story Jesus shared with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. This is the story that our children need to hear. To paraphrase a familiar song, it will never lose its power. God has charged us to worship him to tell future generations of his presence in our lives and circumstances, to reach all nations with his gospel, to train disciples with the word of God. And he has given us the power to carry out his plans. We are in unit two with the fourth of five lessons. Faith triumphs, law fails with Lesson 8, Spirit and Flesh. Confused. One modern Bible translation referred to the Christian congregation in Galatians as idiots. Paul's letter to this New Testament church implied they were filled with thinking, intelligent believers, but their theology had gone off track. Paul used a word we translate as bewitched, meaning the Galatians had become fascinated by some false teacher. An evil spell covered the church like a dark cloud. 
Paul seemed surprised. He had preached to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, but now he twice called these believers foolish. They started clear, understanding faith in Jesus alone is salvation. The Holy Spirit had convicted them of these truths, and they believed. Now they have attempted to combine that with Jewish rituals to truly be saved. Challenged Paul challenged the Galatians to think about the Holy Spirit and Paul's work among them. How did Paul work miracles? Was the supernatural things they saw done by law or by faith? And who gave them the Holy Spirit in the first place? What were they going to believe? Convinced Paul used Abraham as his example. God declared Abraham righteous because of his faith in God, not his perfection or adherence to any laws. Genesis, the 15th chapter, verse 6. And those who follow Abraham's example are his true children, God's chosen. Keeping the law is not the same as faith. Right standing before God comes from faith in Christ, not law keeping. Christ's death purchased us and kept us from suffering the payment for our sins. The promise is received, not earned. Section 1 is the life need and is intended for small group discussion. Discuss what it means to be saved in Jesus. After you have read the narrative, Spirit and Flesh, from your student book, notice question 1. What misconceptions do people commonly have about how we are saved and go to heaven? Answers to question 1 might include the idea that you must somehow earn your salvation. The notion that salvation in Jesus is just one of many ways to be saved. And the belief that since God loves us, everyone will go to heaven. These misconceptions undermine the gospel message and undervalue the character and work of Jesus. Question 2. When the New Testament mentions salvation, what does that involve? Question 2 calls us to express our scriptural understanding of salvation. Examples could include a guarantee into the heavenly kingdom and to eternal life. See John, the third chapter, verse 16, the 14th chapter, verse 2, Philippians, the third chapter, verse 20, and 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verse 17. The cleansing of sin and becoming righteous before God. See Colossians, the second chapter, verses 13 through 14. First Peter, the second chapter, verse 24. Adoption as one of God's children. See John, the first chapter, verses 12 through 13. Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 14 through 17. Second Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verse 18. Galatians, the fourth chapter verses 4 through 5. A gift from God. See Romans, the fourth chapter, verse 4. And the demonstration of God's love. See John 3.16. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 8. And Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 4. And question 3. Why can we be saved only through faith in Jesus? For question three, you may say salvation can come only through faith in Christ Jesus since he is the sinless God incarnate and therefore only he is worthy of being a sacrifice for our sins. See 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 21. He died for our sins once and 
for all time. See Hebrews, the seventh chapter, verse 27. And he conquered death when he was resurrected from the dead. See Revelation, the first chapter, verses 17 through 18. Section two is the Bible learning. Study Paul's argument for grace as opposed to legalism. The message of the cross. The historical reality of Jesus' crucifixion was central to Paul's proclamation of the gospel. Galatians the third chapter verse one. Indeed, the apostles' evangelistic message centered on the cross. For instance, in 1 Corinthians the first chapter verse 18, he declared that though the message of the cross has the power to save lives eternally, to unbelievers its message is sheer folly. Also, if unbelievers reject the message of the cross as foolish, they are eternally doomed. Yet, to those who are saved through their God-given faith in the Messiah, the message of the cross is a demonstration of the Father's power. Faith in the Crucified Messiah Our lesson scripture begins with Galatians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 5. From the King James Version. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Hath ye suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain. Verse 5. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Paul begins this section of his letter by addressing his audience as, You foolish Galatians. Even though the message of the redeeming work of Christ's crucifixion had been clearly presented to them, the Judaizers, introduced in Galatians 2, had persuaded them to abandon that message. Paul then challenged the Galatians to confess whether they received the Holy Spirit because of their obedience to the Jewish law or because of their belief in Jesus. Even though they started their walk with the Lord by means of the Spirit, Paul asked the Galatians if they were intending to conclude their lives by means of the flesh which certainly included circumcision. Once more, Paul questioned whether they have received the Holy Spirit and experienced God's miracles because of the works of the law or because of their faith in Jesus. Question 4. What did Paul regard as the basis for the Galatians' salvation? The apostle stressed that his readers were saved because of hearing the proclamation of the gospel. He added that the Spirit used the heralding of the good news to open the eyes of the Galatians to believe. This especially included the truth about Jesus Christ crucified. Question 5. Upon what basis did the Galatians receive the Spirit? Paul refuted the false teaching that people receive the Spirit based on keeping the Jewish law. Instead, the Galatians' reception of the Spirit was due to what they heard from the Apostle and his colleagues. Specifically, after the Galatians believed in the Messiah, the Spirit permanently indwelt them. The Purpose of Miracles Paul noted in Galatians the third chapter verse 5 that along with the proclamation of the gospel 
God worked miracles among those who heard the truth. The four Gospels reveal that Jesus performed many works of power during his earthly ministry, some of which are not recorded in Scripture. John, the 20th chapter, verses 30, the 21st chapter, verse 25. Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 4, states that God also testified to this salvation by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It seems safe to say that the New Testament indicates that miracles served the following purposes. They confirmed Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. The works of power validated Jesus' assertion that he was sent by God and represented him. The miracles substantiated the credibility of the good news about Jesus. The works of power encouraged the doubtful to put their trust in Jesus, and the miracles demonstrated that the one who is loved was willing to reach out to people with compassion and grace. Abraham, a case in point. Galatians, the third chapter, verses 6 through 9. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Verse 9. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Paul turned to Abraham to make his point to the Jewish Christians who sought to exalt the Jewish laws over the atoning work of Christ. The righteousness of Abraham came from his trusting in God, not because of any of his works. In fact, those who have faith are truly Abraham's children. Even Gentiles who have faith in Christ are Abraham's descendants. Indeed, the Lord had promised Abraham that people throughout the world would be blessed through Abraham's faith. Just as the Lord had blessed Abraham, he will surely bless all those who also have such faith as his. Question 6. Who are the true children of Abraham from verse 7? The Judaizers taught that keeping the Jewish law was required to become a spiritual descendant of Abraham. Paul countered that legalistic observances were irrelevant. Instead, it was through faith in the Son that repentant sinners became Abraham's true children. Question 7. In what sense was the gospel announced in advance to Abraham from verse 8? Paul had in mind the occasion in which God declared that all nations would be blessed through Abraham. The apostle argued that this promise included the good news that Gentiles would be justified by faith. The pledge was made centuries before the advent of the Messiah. Redeemed from the curse of the law. Galatians, the third chapter, verses 10 through 14. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. 
verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Paul continued his argument against the works of the law, stating that all who rely on the law to be justified are under a curse. Moreover, no one who relies on the law is justified before God. Instead, those who live by faith in Christ are justified in the eyes of God. Scripture has revealed that all are under the curse of the law, but Christ has taken away that curse from those who believe in him. Therefore, God's blessing that had come to Abraham now comes to Gentiles through faith in Jesus and that they are blessed with the promised Spirit of God. Question 8. Why does reliance on the law not lead to justification? Paul stated that faith was the basis for justification before the Father. It is impossible to be justified in God's sight by trying to keep the law. In fact, depending on the law in this way results in being placed under its curse. And question 9. How might anyone be rescued from the curse of the law? From verse 13. Paul revealed that obsessive rule keeping never delivered anyone from the curse pronounced by the law. Rather, it was the Messiah through his sacrificial death who made it possible for redemption to be secured. Those who trust in him are not only freed from the law's curse, but also become heirs of the blessing given to Abraham. Additional Observations About Abraham Paul's observations about Abraham made in Galatians the third chapter verses 6 through 8 are complemented by the apostles additional statements recorded in Romans the fourth chapter. Abraham was particularly important as an example for the Jews thought they had a privileged relationship with God by virtue of their physical relationship with Abraham as his descendants. Paul's basic argument was that Abraham was not justified because of faith plus circumcision. Instead, the famed patriarch was justified by faith alone. Verse 9. Next, in verse 10, Paul raised the important question whether Abraham was justified before or after he was circumcised. The apostle answered that it was not after, but before. Paul then pointed out that Abraham was circumcised as a sign, verse 11, or seal that he had already been justified by faith. The circumcision was a testimony to his justifying faith. This ultimately means then that Abraham is not only the father of Jews, but is, in fact, the father of all who believe, including Gentiles. The Promise of the Spirit Paul's reference to the promise of the Spirit of verse 14 parallels Jesus' earlier statement recorded in Acts the first chapter verses 4 through 8. There we learn that the Holy Spirit of Acts, the first chapter, verse 4, is the Father's gift to all who believe in the Son. The baptism the Savior had in mind was the power, verse 8, of the Spirit upon Jesus' followers. Specifically, they would be effective in their testifying about the Messiah to the lost through the Spirit's permanent indwelling presence. Acts the second chapter verses 1 through 4 further reveals that on the day of Pentecost, while the disciples were assembled in one place, the Spirit came upon them. They could sense the Spirit's coming audibly through wind and visibly 
through fire. This phenomenon was significant for it indicated that God's sacred presence was among Jesus' followers in a more powerful and personal way than they had ever experienced before. As noted above, the Spirit empowered them to reach out to the lost with the saving message of the Gospel. Section 3 is the Bible Application Understand Why Only Jesus Saves When you have read under the heading, A Moment to Always Remember, how will you answer the following questions? Question 10. What is your perception of Jesus? Question 11. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If so, why is it a moment you will always remember? And question 12. If you have not received him as Lord and Savior, what would change your mind about him? Answers to question 10 could include the Messiah or Christ, the Son of God, and the Redeemer, as well as Jesus being wise, sinless, compassionate, empathetic, and loving. Question 11 invites us to recall how we first became a Christian and ponder its significance on our lives, which may consist of turning from sin, receiving a purpose in life, and having a vital and personal connection with God. Those who are not in a relationship with Christ may consider the roadblocks that impede their receiving Jesus as their Savior. These roadblocks may be going against their family, not wanting to give up their current lifestyle, or not feeling worthy enough to be saved. Section 4 is the Life Response Believe in the Atoning Work of Christ From the moment of our salvation in Jesus, there will always be ideas that will tempt us to think that Jesus alone does not redeem us. During our earthly walk with our Lord, these ideas will try to fool us into thinking that we must do more to be truly acceptable in the eyes of God. If we are fooled, spiritual troubles will beset our lives and our joy in Christ will fade. Students, therefore, must fully anchor their trust in Jesus' atoning work to spiritually grow and thrive. The key verse of our lesson is from Galatians, the third chapter, verse 2b. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. God has blessed us with another opportunity to share in the study of his holy word. We thank God for you joining us today and for supporting the Sunday School Ministry of New Mount Zion. If it's the Lord's will, we invite you to join us for next week's lesson from Galatians, the third chapter, verses 23 through the fourth chapter, verse 7. Think of things that are commonly inherited and what you have inherited over the years. Next week, we will study more of what God gives by discussing the value of following the commands that God provides and by the friendship that Jesus offers. Let us close out our day's session as we look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are eternally grateful for the new life that we have by faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and for redeeming us from the sins that we've committed. We pray that you will move on the hearts of the lost that they may trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life amen